Western. Um, so actually, so Bud Hunter got his PhD at McGill, uh, where he was really interested in, uh, well, HPA access. Uh, and uh, actually got his, his start using electrophysiology to study uh, some of these issues in HPA uh, and stress um, when he went for his postdoc to Calgary to work with J.D. Bates. And um, a, a lot of my interest in, in his recent work has to do with uh, some of the plasticity that he sees under chronic stress that is not merely synaptic plasticity, but actually acting at even lower levels on, on the neuron. And he's going to tell us about some of that today. Right. So uh, thanks very much. Great. So can, <laughs> can, can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to use my and I thank you, Data, for other, of, other organizers of this colloquium series for having me here today. I'm having a very good day today. So, <laughs> my lab is interested in how we respond to and then adapt to stress. This adaptation to stress is a clear form of learning that is induced by experiences, stressful ones, and it changes behavior in the future. So to understand the biological basis of this learning paradigm, I studied neural plasticity caused by stress and how such neural plasticity contribute to change behavior. And this problem is also important at clinical importance because chronic stress is a major risk factor for various psychiatric disorders such as major depression. Although those psychiatric disorders associated with stress are very complex, but one major hypothesis in the field is that the recruitment of stress response, which itself is a coping mechanism at the time of stress, can cause maladaptive changes or plasticity in the brain when repeatedly or chronically active. And then for chronic stress, one thing I want to add is actually chronic stress is not always resulting in diseases or psychiatric disorder, but in fact, most of the cases, most of us are totally fine, but quite fine, in the presence of chronic stress. This is partly because we do, that we and animals, have a mechanism to modu modulate the responsiveness to stress. For example, getting used to it so that we respond less and less to a types of stressor that does not require full-blown, potentially costly stress response. So today, I would like to show my recent, our recent data finding some type of neural plasticity that develops after repeated exposure to stress, and that we believe is important for modulating stress response and actually uh, decreasing our stress response risk. So what is stress? Stress is actually, I teach stress a tricky term, because depending on how, who you ask, the answer can be quite different. And this is famously noted by the founder of stress research, Ken Serie, and what he says is everybody knows what the stress is, but nobody knows what it is. It's true, it's elusive, if you think hard, it's elusive. And then going back to physiology textbook, stress is defined as anything that disrupts your well-being or homeostasis. So it can be problems like inflammation caused by injury or infection, or starvation, that is a metabolic challenge. So those are real or physical problems your body has, and it has to be fixed in order to survive. So those are real stressors, but it can also be psychological stress, which is daily hassle or more major stressor. But those stressor, in fact, does not involve any physical change in your body function. It's all anticipated. So. This psychological stress is an anticipated thing for something bad to happen. And then, interestingly or importantly, brain recognizes those completely different, you know, modality of sensory information, let me say, as stressor. And once it recognizes as a stressor, it triggers a common set of physiological and behavioral changes we call stress messages. So, in order to explain what the stress response, this seemingly stress-free you know, Canadian landscape gives us a great example, which is this. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting a bear on a hike is an evolutionarily concerned primary example of stressor. And importantly, we still use the same set of stress response in order to cope with or respond to more modern type of stress. Okay. And 
there are two important aspects of stress response. The first is, as you can see here, run as fast as you can. The so more generally, so stress triggers immediate fight or flight response. So you, so it triggers psychologically, you are more focused, alert. Physiologically, you have a higher heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature. All these changes are together to boost up your capacity to handle this impending challenge. And perhaps among those changes, one of the best characterized is a neuroendocrine stress response that eventually results in the elevation of glucocorticoids in the saturation. So this is an early example done in rat showing the elevation of corticosterone, that's a major glucocorticoid in rodents, after brief exposure to stress. So this immediate fight or flight response is an innate function for stress reflex, but flexibility in a stress response is also important because we see stress every day or one after another. So second important aspect of stress is to remember so that you change your responsiveness or response to stress depending on your past experience. And in fact, stress is a potent enhancer of your memory. And you can easily imagine if you had a narrow escape from bear attack, you will remember that for life. Yeah? And it will certainly change how you behave when you go to hike next time, but you may not be able to go to hike anymore. Yeah? So stress enhances memory. And then this stress-induced memory enhancement of formation is not only limited to those explicit or declarative memory, it also happens at the level of physiology or body. And it's been known for a long time, this neuroendocrine stress response can be sensitized or desensitized, depending on how the, the paradigm of stress you use. So just to place what I am interested in in a bigger picture, I use one more slide. So what I mentioned so far is there are interactions between brain and stress response. So when you see the stress cell, the brain regulates stress response. But this very stress response, in fact, in turn changes the brain and then changes how the brain responds to stress in the future. So you can see there are dynamic or recurrent interactions between brain and stress response. And this is a process we call stress adaptation. So today, the data I show is a neural plasticity that develops slowly through the recurrent exposure or repeated exposure to stress. And in the end, we believe have played play important role changing the responsiveness to stress. So the system we work on is the neural endocrine stress response. So that is regulated by hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis. So as the name tells, it starts from the hypothalamus. More specifically, it's a population of neuron in the area called the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, PBN, that synthesize and secrete CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, into the hypophysial cortical saturation. So this CRH reaches the anterior pituitary and then stimulates the second hormone, ACTH, and ACTH finally acts on the adrenal gland and then stimulates the synthesis and release of glucocorticoid, so corticosterone in rodents and then cortisol in human upright. So this is how you get this hormonal response after a single exposure. So this neuroendocrine less function has been known to be very plastic. For example, this early a uh, study by Greti uh, Aguilera, beautifully shown. So they looked at the hormone of the ACTH level, which is an intermediate hormone for HPA axis, uh, right after a fast exposure to immobilization in that. So as you can see here, there's a, a quite striking elevation of the stress hormone. But if they repeat this same stress every day, four days up to 14 days, as you can see, the stress-induced elevation of ACTH gradually decreases to the level of there's no longer significant elevation. So this clearly tells this neuroendocrine stress response can somehow slowly but robustly adapt or habituate to certain type of stress. Another important 
study in this field is so similarly biased for heart conductor and others. Similarly, they look at the ACGG response. In this case, they show a full time force after the stressor called restraint. So, as similar to here, what they show is the robust elevation of the ACTH when animal is stressed for the first time. If they repeat eight consecutive days, the response is diminished, as you see here. But then they left those animals for three weeks unstressed so that they have a time to forget about it and then stress them again. Then what they found is those animals still show this diminished response. This clearly indicates you know, those repeated exposure to certain type of stressor causes a long lasting changes in the brain so that it changes their responsiveness to the stress. So we are interested in studying this neural mechanism. And this habituation of a neural enzyme response or adaptation seems to be clinically also important. So another study have found that when they compare two different strain of blood, this picture lab, the whole, uh, the black one, does not show the habituation after repeated exposure to the same type of stressor. In comparison to Spragudawira, which is a common lab, they show already nice adaptation. So there's some genetic background for the ability to you know, develop this habituation. And this lack of habituation accompanied by some behavioral impairment that develops after chronic stress. So this is a special lab. And after repeated stress, these rats show the decreased social interaction, which is like a social, like it's a kind of animal model for social withdrawal that we see, we can see in the, for example, patient in major depression. Also, a chronic elevation of cortisol is one of the common biological abnormality found in patients suffering depression. This is the circadian you know, changes of cortisol in normal people and then subpopulation of patients suffering depression. And this points to that the HPA axis hyperactivity can be a biological link between stress and then some of the psychiatric disorders like major depression. So understanding how those HPA axis function changes over chronic stress is a clinically important question. So how are we going to address this one? As I mentioned, so HPA axis starts from the release of CRH from a specific neural endocrine neuron in the hypothalamus. The release of CRH is like any other neurotransmitter, regulated by the firing activity of these neurons. And the firing activity of these neurons is regulated by the synaptic input coming from many brain areas that's been known to be involved in stress response. So it's a complex problem. There can be you know, here or there, there may be some neural plasticity. So it's a complex, but then as a starting point, our strategy is let's start looking at this very end of this circuit. And if you find any plasticity that can correlate or explain the change that happened in the hormonal response, that has a direct and most powerful influence on the output. So we study these neurons. So the work I'm going to show from now has been done mostly by our recent uh, master student, Sarah Matovic, with some help uh, by Aoi, who was a honors student at that time, and she now does PhD in my lab. So at the start, we wanted to re-establish this repeated restaurant model done in rat in mice. So we started, so this is a kind of, maybe looks over, but we put the mouse into a tube that is well ventilated. So it's a kind of a, you know, inexpensive way to stress animal and also stomach. So we started to do this in mice. The reason for switching to mice is because of the availability of transgenic animal. For example, in this case, we use a CRH reporter line so that we can see, we can visually identify which are the CRH neurons by using this transgenic animal. And we stressed a restrained stressed mouse one hour every day up to 21 days. And then we also gave you know, no stress recovery period, seven or 28 days, just to replicate what has been reported in class. And then we studied first to look at the activation of the CRH neuron in the PBN uh, by using 
C force immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So C force is an immediate allergen known to be upregulated in the neuron that had a higher level of activity in the recent like a few hours. So and then red is the CRH neuron because of thanks to this transgenic animal expressing red fluorescent protein. So you can see nice, nice cluster of neurons that making this triangular form. So each dot is a cell body. And then green is a C C for immunoreactivity. As you can see here, so here uh, there's a sun wave. And then the colocalization of this green and the red channel are shown as white for representation facts. So as you can see here, under normal, non-stress condition, there's little or if any expression of CFOS in this CR genome showing these guys are not stressed. After a single acute stress, we see a robust upregulation of CFOS. And then this activation of CFOS activity of this neuron does not really change after seven days of daily stress. Unlike rat, mouse show no habituation within one week. But if we keep going for three weeks, we see robust attenuation of the activation of these neurons by the same stress. So mouse seems to take longer than rat to habituate to this restraint. And then we also get no stress seven days or 28 days of recovery period. And then stress once again, and look at the CFOS response. Again, unlike rat, mouse are more easy to forget. So they do not show habituation anymore after seven days of no stress. So this is a summary. So what we see is this robust activation or induction CFOS was strongly attenuated in the mouse that's been repeated to the stress for 21 consecutive days. And then importantly, this C force level in individual animals are positively correlated with the level of cholesterol in the circulation, suggesting or confirming so this change in neural responsiveness to restraint is a neuronal correlate for this hormonal adaptation. So the question is, so we, we, we made a very simple hypothesis. So what happening in the CRH neuron is stress information during restraint eventually comes to this neuron as an excitatory input and then activate and that drives the hormonal output. To the same stressor, something happened to this neuron and then therefore the output is, output is smaller. So we wanted to find is there any change at the level of these neuron that can explain this hypothesis. So to do this, we use a whole cell patch clock recording in acute stress. What we do is we prepare animal, take out the brain quickly, and then make a fresh thin slice. And then under the microscope, we poke the cell and to do the recording of neural activity. And then this is like a great power, power of this transgenic animal. We can nicely see in a living brain which cells are red fluorescent so that under the microscope, we can visually identify these are the grass electrodes we record, to be used to record some neuron. Ident we can record from the identified CRH genome. You know, this neuron, very similar under normal microscope, is actually not CRH genome, so we can have a selective recording from the particular uh, type of neuron. This is particularly important in PBN because there are different types of neurons that have completely different functions in the same nucleus, for example, regulating your blood osmolality. Are sitting right next to CRG, so it's important for us to distinguish. So, as a start, we did a very simple experiment. So, we do a whole cell patch clamp recording, and then we give artificial current injection so that we can like mimic input. So, then when we inject the polarizing current, cell fires action potential. It's a simple way of exci artificially exciting the neuron and then see how excitable they are. So then we can construct this current injection. So this is our command injection. And then how much spike that a cell makes. For example, in this example, when we give 10 plus 10 picoamp of current injection, this particular cell made 11 spikes. And then the more you inject the current, they make more spikes. And then you can compare this input-output relationship between control and chronic st chronified stress animal, a cell from those animals. And as you can see here, there's a clear decrease in the excitability of spike number 
and here is the um, a number of recording from number of animals. So we can see a clear and pretty robust right of shift in the spike number current to injection relationship or input out relationship. So here's the average input out relationship, and with very tight bar, we see a, a robust decrease in the excitability of the CR genome after three weeks of delivery restraint. And then when we continue doing the time course study, as we did for histology, so right after a single stressor, we see no change at all from the control, meaning a single stress is not sufficient to cause this hypoexcitability of neuron. When we did the same experiment after seven days of repeat restraint, when we did not see a significant habituation, we see only a partial change. And then after three weeks, we see full development. And then when we give one week of recovery, where we see the recovery of C first expression, we again see the recovery of the excitability of those neurons. So here is a summary of this input out relationship as a like, total spike number. So it's a kind of area under the curve of this curve. As you can see here, there is a slowly developing but very robust decrease in the excitability of the CRH neuron in hypothalamus after the repeat. So the next question is what is the mechanism? How, what is the mechanism making these neurons less excitable? So the usual suspect is probably sodium channel, voltage created sodium channel that is important for drive action potential, or potassium channel that makes uh, cells less excitable. So at the first step, we looked at, we analyzed the same data, but more carefully looked at the kinetics of action potential. Those things can inform those changes. But so when we look at the threshold of action potential height, however, we see no difference. So threshold was the same, no difference. Or action potential height, we also look at the slope, hyperpolarization hyper level. We didn't find any difference. However, for the same data, what we noticed was sub-threshold membrane change. So when you look at here, as you can see here, the amount of membrane potential change by current injection is greater in control. So if you plot this current injection versus membrane potential relationship here, this slope is by simple Ohm's law. So you know, uh, voltage divided to current is resistance. You know, it's a high school physics. Maybe it makes your headache. But, you know. So the this apparent membrane resistance or cell resistance is significantly lower. So what we find is cell become less resistant or decrease the resistance as a whole. So then we looked again, look at the time code. So consistent with what we see in the excitability, this resistance you know, slowly decreases and reaches statistical significance only after three weeks of stress. And this is very similar to what we see. This is that the data I showed before, the total number of spikes of excitability. Very nice similarity. So when we plot the correlation, there's a very tight positive correlation between the resistance and the total spike number, suggesting this membrane resistance change is one of the major contributors for the decrease in excitability. So that's a quick summary. What we see so far is that so stress arrives, stress information or signal arrives to this neuron as, as a form of synaptic input or synaptic transmission. What it does is it opens up positive ion channel and then causes influx of positive ion charge so that it depolarizes the membrane. So if we assume they receive the same amount of positive charge influx as we did in the experiment, what is happening is after chronic stress, the membrane becomes leakier. So there's a more escape of those positive charge so that the membrane potential change is less, so they are less excited. It's more like a leaky you know, balloon or something. It's more difficult to blow up. So then what, next question, what made the, this cell membrane leakier? Again, usual suspect is channels. So for example, if you express higher concentration of potassium channel, that opens up a pore of the positive ion to escape through. 
So to study those changes, the first step we do is we normalize the resistance by the total surface area. Because similar to electronic cable, the cable resistance is determined by the material that has specific resistance and the total size, which is the area. Yeah? And then we are measuring both together so far. So then what we want to do is this resistance should be normalized by the size of the cell surface area. And then cell membrane is a lipid by layer that act as a capacitor. So there's a relatively simple way to measure cell capacitor, just, just analyze this capacitive current, so that we can have a rough estimate of the cell membrane surface area by using some of So we can simply normalize the resistance we see by the capacitance we measure from the same cell so that we can get the estimate of specific membrane resistance, meaning membrane resistance per micro square meter of the membrane. By doing so, to our surprise, we lost all the significant change. And then we lost a nice, very nice correlation we saw before. So this suggests that in fact, what is changing was the capacitance or cell size. So what we see actually is a pretty robust increase in the capacitance of the neurons after being exposed to the bit to restraint. And then there was a pretty tight negative correlation this time between the capacitance and then excitability of the cell measured at total spectrum. So on average, what we see is about 30% increase. So this is a number is been from here. 30% increase in the capacitance of the cell we measure electrophysiologically indicating cell become bigger, and importantly, this change is again reversible after leaving the animal non-stressed for several more days, like we see, you know, the seaports or hormonal recovery of, of the response. So this was a little surprising. We usually, you know, it's all, we usually assume this channel expression changing, those things, but then I never saw the cell size being changing. So the next question is, how, is there, you know, is is a cell really bigger? So now we took the two photo, using two photo microscopy, we took a thin images of the CRS neuron in the active brain slice so that we can have a fully you know, preserved cell body in the image. So analyze this cell body surface area using a software. By doing so, yes, we saw statistically significant or increase in the cell soma surface area after 21 days of repeated stress. So these are the cell based average, and then we average by animal. So there's a significant increase in the cell soma surface area after the basic respect. And then from the same slice, we did a electrophysiological recording to make sure there's a still capacitance change. And yes, yes indeed, it was the case. We see again, it produced significant increase in the capacitance, so electrophysiological measure of cell capacitance. Which is great, seeing the statistical significance is the important, I think. But one thing we are kind of both are not convinced clearly, what's the magnitude of the change? So when we look at the increase in cell surface area, it's only like, you know, 5% of increase. Although it's statistically significant, but it's only 5%, that is much smaller than the magnitude of increase in the capacity, which is 22%. So then we are missing some big chunk by just measuring the somatic membrane area. So what, what else? And another important point is that, so you know, early biophysical work on those membrane capacitance and electrophysiology have shown that, so one picofarade of capac capacitance is all equal to 100 micrometer square of lipid by layer. And then this unit or constant is quite consistent, whatever the composition of lipid by layer. That's kind of a dogma in the field. And then by, look, by using this value, for example, this 20 picofarad average after stress should end up to be 2,000 micrometer square of cell surface area. But what we measure morphologically it's a quarter of that. So again, we are missing huge chunk 
of morphological correlates of the electrophysiological measurement of sex axis. So what are we missing? So one obvious thing is the dendrite. So neuron <coughs> not, has not only the cell body, it has a structure called dendrite. And then those contribute to the electrophysiological reading of the capacity. So we fill the cell and then fix it and we constructed the morphology of those hypothalamic neurons. And unlike hippocampal or cellular protein J or you know, plant down neuron in the cortex, those hypothalamic neurons are pretty simple. It only has like four up to four dendrites, no spines, pretty simple. And then in this neuron, we did not find any dramatic change in the more uh, dendritic complexity. And then we did a short analysis that simply we just like, apply different radius of circle and count how many you know, dendrites crossing the circle. This, yeah, and then there's no difference. So dendrite is not a source of this dramatic difference in the capacity. So then what else? It's a, a big problem. So we started to read you know, more papers, which I don't do, so then figure <laughs> out. So in the cell biology field, which is not my expertise, it's been known a long time that you know, then it's obvious for retrospectively, cell membrane is not smooth. But then when you look at ultra structure of the cell, there's a lot of folding or microstructure. That can be detected by electrophysiological measurement as a capacitance or surface, but then at confocal or two photon microscopy resolution, you see as a smooth cell. And there's a beautiful experiment done by uh, this at the Zolex group. So they use a uh, cultured astrocyte and they measure this cell surface area, the, the morphological surface area. And then what they did is they applied hypoosmotic video. So that with the osmotic pressure, cell swells. And then that's a way to measure how much membrane you have. So as you can see here, by applying hypoosmotic medium, cell surface area swells, increases dramatically. This is a single cell, this is the average. And then simultaneously, they did the electrophysiological recording, keep measuring the capacitance. And then despite this huge swelling, swelling there's no change in capacitance. Beautifully showing. Yes, so the, the surface membrane area of cell has a lot of reservoir for ability to expand without the need to insert more lipid by lipid. So, the, so capacitance is leading the actual lipid. So the kind of like idea is so cell, we used to think, think like this, but it's more like this. So we are missing a lot of complexity. So okay, let's try the similar experiment in our system. So what we did is a kind of opposite way. So we use a hyperosmotic recording solution, okay, and then once we and with a fluorescent dye. Mm -hmm. Once we patch the cell, we infuse the cell with hyperosmotic solution, so it's gonna swell up and rupture. So here's the example. So we patch the cell. You can see that the cell here. Once we start to dialyze the cell, you see green fluorescence inside the cell, and then it swells and eventually blows up. So you lose the dye. <laughs> um, yeah, balloon experiment. So we measured, the, you know, we did a repeated measurement of that sac of cell surface area. So we see a clear increase in cell area. And then with intermittent measurement of the capacitance, as you can see here, capacitance does not change, but cell can swell as much as four times. And importantly, there's a nice coincidence. So this cell had about 20 picofaraday of capacitance, and that predicts by 100, uh, one picofarad equal to 100 micro square meter, it should be around 2,000, and the maximum cell body size it can reach is about 2,000. Okay, so we did this experiment in both control condition and after chronic stress. So as, we, I, as I show as an example, in both cases, there's a robust like, increase in size after growing up. But then importantly, the maximum size it can reach was greater after repeated stress. And then in terms of capacitance, we do see capacitance increases after stress, but there is no change after growing up. And we see a significant correlation 
between the maximum cell size and the capacitance. So what we find is like this. So at the baseline condition, at the very beginning, the cell size difference was still significant or significant there, about 80%, similar to our previous you know, image analysis. But after blowing up, the difference reached around 30%. And this is very similar to this capacitance readout difference, which was in this batch version, 42%. So what we now think is cell surface area is, has a lot more complexity, and this complexity seems to increase after repeated stress so that it can accommodate more surface membrane area in a limited volume in the brain. So what kind of like complexity is really happening in this cell? So we collaborated with the electron microscopist at the lab, Maria Vatrumbri, asked her to look at the, you know, those cell membranes. So this is a, a cross section of CRH neuron. So this is a nucleus, very large. And then this blue area is the cytoplasm. And this edge of blue area is the uh, plasma membrane at the stroma. And this is controlled after 21 stress. In terms of perimeter, we only see a small trend. We do not need statistical significance after stress, which is kind of, kind of similar to small change in the volume or surface area we measure. But then when we look at this you know, surface membrane, so this is the surface membrane area, but we find we do not find like a robust folding or reservoir type structure, but there are more like a ruffles on the membrane. So there was a kind of a measurement that she told me we can do is that it's called solidity, which essentially we divide area, the actual area of the cell by the convex area, like you, you see in front, we, we I show in pink. So the deviation from one kind of indicates the complexity of the surface or roughly. And then there was a statistically significant decrease in the solidity. Again, confirming the idea that after repeated resonance stress, this neuron increases surface complexity so that it can accommodate more surface area than in the body. So, our conclusion is that so, after repeated resonance stress, where we see the robust habituation to that stressor, what, happening, what is happening is cell become bigger with increases the complexity, and that increases this change in the membrane resistance. So cell become weaker. So even if you get a same amount of excitatory synaptic input, there are more leak so that cell can fire less. And that's the one mechanism we propose may be important for decreasing the stress, the responsiveness to stress in this condition. It's a little surprising ending, but then we start to think, so the size of the cell, well, I did not think so much, really matter for you know, neuronal function or responsiveness. And I didn't find so many papers, but there was actually an old theory proposed by Henneman. It's called size principle. It was kind of provo provocative theory, but he's a, a physiologist working on the motor neuron in spine. And what he observed is that there are different sizes of motor neurons. And when he did the physiological measurement, smaller diameter motor neuron have a lower threshold. And then larger one has a higher threshold. And then in fact, the larger one innervates a bigger muscle area, so it has a higher input, output. But his theory, essentially, is there are heterogeneity in the population of neuron. Some has lower threshold for activation, some has higher threshold. But as a population, this heterogeneity can create a more smooth or wider dynamic range of how the system works. So maybe this similar thing is happening in our system, and then after stress, we see like an overall increase, population level increase in the size, and then it is shifting the threshold of the system towards higher. And then in our case, you know, it improves, involves the complexity of the memory. So that's the conclusion. I Am I on? Five more minutes ish. Yeah. So, this is a mechanism we propose to explain habituation to the repeated stress, so you have a less response. But this is actually not the whole story. I'm just saying one side. 
And it's been known since the day of this Aguilera's Aliva. This habituation is specific to the stressor you repeated. And then, if you give a different type of stressor, called novel stressor, after, you know, in the animal that habituated to the restraint of immobilization, those animals can respond fully or even in a synthesized manner. So, these are some, you know, stressor specificity in the restaurants. And we also confirmed in our own model that. So we use as a novel stressor, cold stream, cold stream, so we drop the mouse into the cold water. It sounds horrible, maybe not. Sorry. <laughs> but it's a simple way, again, to stress animal. So we first confirm these two stressors induce similar degree of CFOS in the PBN neuron, so it's similar intensity, I may say. And then after 21 days of repeated stress, they habituate to repeated restraint, but if you give cold swim instead of repeated restraint, restraint, they do respond in the same way as novel stressor, as a single stress. So again, we confirm stressor specificity of this habituation. Then how can this you know, postsynaptic overall decrease in the excitability can accommodate this stressor specificity? That's a one big question. But then, what we see as a hypo-excitable is because when we give a same input after stress, those neurons fire less. The simplest way to overcome this hypo-excitability is when you have novel stressor, there may be a higher input. Then you can achieve same or even higher level of output. So if you control the excitatory input to this neuron, when you see the novel stressor, through different plasticity, you can easily overcome this hyperexcitability. So I have new hypothesis is that. So after a bit of stress, when we see hypertrophy of the neuron, hyperexcitability, there must be an increased excitatory input to accommodate stress specificity. So this part was done by another master student. Now she's a PhD student, Julia. So she looked at now synaptic input to this CRS genome by using the same technique, but with a different version. So we now look at this synaptic current. So these are the current passing through the glutamatergic, uh, ionotropic glutamate receptor. So each, you know, this straight vertical line is a synaptic activity. And by measuring the frequency or amplitude of those things, we can have a functional estimate of how much glutamatergic synapse one neuron receives. So we did this very measurement, but in addition, so this is a quite artificial you know, measurement situation. So we kill the animal, slice the brain, so we cut a lot of input to the neuron, and then record the neuron in that situation. So there's no way they are in a stressed condition. They may be traumatically stressed, but you know, no real stress. So to mimic stress-related condition, we apply the post current, which is an activator of cyclic AMP, and that kind of mimics a lot of actions of a lot of neuromodulators, like noradrenaline or dopamine, that are known to act in the PVM to drive HP access. So after applying post current, we see increase in the frequency of this synaptic current. So we can think this is a way to mimic stress condition. So in this condition, we compare under normal con uh, control animal or repeated to the stress animal. As you can see, post coding increases the number of those synaptic events. And when we quantify, what we see is at baseline, we see slight increase in the frequency of this excitatory event. But after post coding, the increase was greater. A consistent, like, consistent with our prediction, there seems to be a potentiation of glutamate synapse function after repeated restraint stress. This may be a way, a potential way, to overcome this that post-synaptic hypoexcitability that we observe. And then mechanistically, we identify that cyclic AMP-dependent potentiation or activation of synapse that we argue to mimic stressful condition is mediated by HCM channel. It's a hyperparalyzation activated cyclic nucleotide dependent channel. It's like a voltage and chemical messenger dependent channel. So when we block this channel with ZD788, this is a specific antagonist, 
we block the increase in the frequency significantly in under normal condition, and then it does block after stress. But then blockage, in fact, made the difference between normal and stress condition there's no difference. So we assume that it's the potentiation of glutamate receptor function is likely due to the upregulation of one of the HCL channels. So that's the part we are still working on. So in summary, what we find is, yes, there are postsynaptic structure function involved plasticity that makes CL new and hypoexcitable after the bit of stress, but then on the presynaptic side, there are potentiation of excitatory input. So those two opposing chains, in fact, have a, like a flexibility in the system so that it can accommodate stressor-specific habituation of stress response. This is important because you need still, you still need stress response when you have to respond to a new, a new type of stress, but you don't want to respond to unnecessary stress all the time with high, high level of stress. OK. So, I'd like to thank you. Sarah Matovic is a major driver of the cell size change project, and I already had the histology part when she's doing fourth year, and now she's doing the in vivo electrophysiology of PFT, and then Julia did the, the synaptic project. Thank you for your time. Who use like a one star day stress paradigm 
uh, but over three weeks, then just once a day, but then once a week. And then after three weeks, they see habituation, which is much nicer because they don't have to stress every day. Uh, so in that case, they don't see a uh, robust change in cell size. So there may be some difference between those type of apathy type of adaptation versus habituation. So yeah, we'll see. Yes. So, so in the Henneman's size principle, the small neurons lead to the smallest response, like the smallest forces, yeah. and the large neurons to the largest forces. So yeah. It's a little bit opposite, I think, to your scenario. So, yes and no. So, in terms of uh, one aspect of Henneman's theory is smallest neuron have a, a lowest threshold, but also the smallest response. Yes, the smallest. So, force. in this one, so what we don't know, you are absolutely right. So, we only touch that the change in threshold for the activation, but then the maximum output, this larger neuron, can drive after you know, there's a, a huge stressor. We, don't, we haven't tested in vivo. So we only use the same type of stressor, they gradually habituate. Yeah. And I, what I don't know is if I give now a really nasty stress, you know, and to, max, to measure the maximum output, they may have higher output. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I was uh, just wondering if uh, the spontaneous activity of, the, if there was spontaneous activity in your neur in the neurons that release the stress hormone, and if it all correlates with their uh, threshold. In vivo or so ex vivo? Uh, in vivo, we don't know, and that's why why we started to do the in vivo electrophysiology. Yeah. And then, so in terms of most likely, the assumption is there will be spontaneous activity because HP acid is not only for stress, but they do you know have a circadian cycle and then it's essential for our regular function. So now the question is how those two different information coexist and then you know what type of firing are you know driving different type of output and also how which one and how they change after pronunciation. We don't know. And then you know assumption is they will become less excited about spontaneous level. And then when we actually look at slice level, we can measure like a, we call it a spontaneous firing, meaning when we do a recording without controlling the membrane potential, uh, they fire less after stress. But then, yeah, they fire less, yes. Okay. This change the predictability of the structure? Can you change at all the No. So we specifically aim to repeat the threshold stress as predictable as possible. Yeah. Predictable. So that's the paradigm for habituation. But we did test uh, more um, a chronic variable stress that you know, removed the pre predictability part. And then, actually, to our surprise, we see similar change in cell size. So we, that, that's the part we started to wonder is it habituation? To a more general adaptation. So my question is kind of related to that. Actually, um, do you have any idea if you see the habituation if there was a long-term punishment or cost associated with the stress? Because I assume a possibility might be these animals just learn that even though they're stressed in that short-term scenario, mm -hmm. they're just going to go back in their cage or whatever. Yeah, I think so. That is so. for habituation. That would be important part. So habituation what happens more easily to the type of stressor that does not cause real problem. So the milder the stress is, or the more psychological or milder the stress is, they have a change past. Yeah. And then my assumption that restraint in the tube is not a harsh one because there's no actual damage to the end. Yes. Do you have an idea for the mechanism by which the membrane becomes more we, we don't know. We would love to know. And then we started to look into the potential mechanism and uh, for so for the folding of membrane the lipid decomposition is important and we do have some data showing that is the case at the end but how it happens we don't know. Yes. So I was wondering if there are like different subtypes of CRH reason even you know, right. because how confident are we given this data that the, the that these cells that are expanding are actually the, the same, same cells you're looking yes. at. So then it's not like a different population that's being right. uh, great question. So there are 
at least two types of CRS genome in the PVM. No. So one is a major one, the neuroendocrine one. And then a small population, it's slightly more posterior to the area where we normally look at, is the one that projects the spinal cord and then driving more on the autonomic nervous system. And then electrophysiologically, we can distinguish those two populations because the autonomic one has a kind of typical calcium spike. You know? So we can tell if that's the case. But then in addition to that, within this new, so I, I, yeah, it's 80%, 85% confident that most of the neurons we measure are neuroendocrine series. Within those populations, is there any heterogeneity? Actually, that's a, a major uh, topic right now. And with the single cell you know, sequencing, we started to see it may be not the case. But before that, you know, essentially cell classification is either, either neurochemical identity or electrophysiological properties. And then those two together, we can see. And then we did a simple part. I actually had a, some small thought. You know, when we do like a PC analysis or those type of analysis of all the variables we measure from electrophysiology, do we see a cluster? We don't. We try, I mean, we haven't pushed too much, but so far we can. But then with transcriptomics data, we probably see something. And then when you look at the morphology, they are all simple, but some actually goes more lateral. I mean, I know, this, the, the way they project their dendrites are quite different. So I'm assuming that uh, study. Yes. So you said you don't have an idea yet what is causing the increased folding, but do you have any speculation about why this mechanism might be used to change the threshold rather than just increasing leakage current? So. Oh. oh, I see. Why this does not change the threshold? And well, why, 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 why this, this, uh, why? this uh, mechanism rather than just inserting more leakage uh, channels? So, that's actually a technical question you don't have to ask me. So, <laughs> yeah. so what, well, this is my, my interpretation, uh, is that, so when you see this shift, by changing the cell size, what happens is we don't change the slope. So when you change this threshold, it will increase the density of organ sodium channel. Then it changes the, this activation slope as well. And then, so that is still probably have a different physiological meaning. So at least for this cell size change, it will simply shift the threshold and the input, like a parallel shift in the input output curve. And that probably have a different physiological consequence than changing the slope. And then threshold is not fixed. So. Yes. Thank you very much, George. I have a question and a comment. The question is, um, to what extent are your results uh, consistent with those of Eric Handel, who investigated habituation in the giant sea slug? Because if I remember correctly, I think most of the habituation that he showed was pre-selected. And the comment I've had relates to the Hedeman size principle, which I really don't think is a very good analogy at all. Okay. Because although there is a size principle, um, Robert Burke showed that Henman's reasoning uh, was not correct, actually, that irrespective of the size of the motor neuron cell body, the synaptic current density would be the same. And a Dutch work has subsequently showed that it was the specific membrane resistance which was altered in the, in the uh, different sizes of the neurons. Okay. Thank you. So I, I will, yeah, I will read more about this. Yes, the, it's true. So it's a, I, I admit, it's a relatively well, simpler analogy. And then, yeah, I, and then Henneman's size principle is a very broad principle. They he even talk about like different biochemical changes depending on cell size. So yes, I will yeah think more about it. Thank you for your comment. What about Kendall? Oh, oh, Kandel. So his his habituation was also presynaptic. Did you say that his his habituation model 
in the, the, in the presynaptic uh, mechanism. Um, if I remember correctly, I think that the major effect was presynaptic, that the, right. the synapses which were withdrawn, mm -hmm. they became non-functional yeah. in habituation. So that, so in that sense, our mechanism is different from lactation because our habituation mechanism is a postsynaptic change. Mm -hmm. And then we rather find a presynaptic change more consistent with sensitization uh, because we see kind of like a potentiation of glutamate like, um, So why this difference happens, I cannot tell. Yes. One more question, and then um, I'll remind people that there's a wine and cheese um, on the second floor. So bring your questions there. I think you had a question. So um, in terms of your stressor that leads to habituation, and then the second stressor, and there's no habituation. So are you um, saying that there is input specificity then on so, the stressor side? I so what. My assumption right now is after repeated exposure to the same stressor, we will see that I, my prediction is there is another type of plasticity that is sensitizing, probably upstream of those hydrothermals, for in general for any type of stress. But then when, so this part actually kind of understand the same type of stressor, so they are responding probably less and less. Not only the hypothalamus, but the upstream are responding less and less to the same type of stress. So overall, we see it habituation. But when you see a newer stressor, probably a, a type of plasticity like we see can mount sensitized response when there is a like a signal that telling that's a normal stress. What we are assuming right now is probably adrenaline or dopamine. Those are the like, uh, salience detection signals. So once you know when we see a new stress instead of habituated stress, probably those dopaminergic or adrenergic system releases more of those neuromodulators. When you when the synapse sees those signal, then response goes up. And then there are some kind of latent type of plasticity that we prepare to be able to mount. 